Genesis chapter 32, picking up in verse 22, I'm going to read to the end of the chapter, and then we're going to discuss this and break this down. In fact, we closed with this section in our previous study, and having not delved into it, into the depth that I wanted to, I want to try to pick up and finish in and fill in some gaps. Genesis chapter 32, verse 22. The text continues, picking up from last time. The same night he, Jacob, arose and took his two wives with two female servants and his eleven children and crossed the fort of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob, verse 24, was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is broken. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And then he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. And bid me one more time. Let's open in prayer. God, I pray that you would touch this word and speak to it. Take your glory. Heal our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been studying over these last several weeks this person of Jacob himself. And the thing that we've seen about Jacob is that he's a clever man. He's a man that's trying to ordain his own life. God had promised to him the certain blessings and the birthright, but Jacob decided to take the blessing that God had given unto him and try to make it come about in his own strength and prowess. So he put his hand to the work of God, not unlike his father Abraham, who took the handmaid, even though God told Abraham that through his seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed, having 25 years go by and not seeing the blessing that God had promised, he decided to help God out. And the way he decided to help God out was to get the handmaid and to have a child through her. And it produced what we found to be Ishmael. And Ishmael, as opposed to being a blessing to the whole earth, has actually become a curse to the whole earth. And so he follows the example in some sense of his grandfather, where he's trying to accomplish what God had told him he's going to do in his own strength. And so it is with us that God can come to us and say certain things to us. He can give us a blessing. He can give us a job. He can give us a wife. He can give us a girl. Whatever it is, he can give us a good thing, and then we begin to take it about with ourselves to make it happen. We step outside of his time frame. We begin to pursue the very thing that he had given to us, and it becomes an idol, and therefore God has to begin to deal with us. And here it tells us in this passage, he deals with them to such a degree that he knocks his hip out of joint and leaves them with a permanent limp. In other words, he puts Jacob into a wreck with God where his hip is knocked out of joint. And so what we see is that this process begins to take place in his life, culminated here at the end of chapter 32 of Jacob becoming a broken man. God, when he deals with a man or calls a man, he will first hurt him and wound him deeply. And as he wounds the man and brings him to that conformity through the wounding and the difficulty of life, he never does it because of cruelty. God never does something to people because he simply wants to be mean. If he wanted to be mean, there's certainly things that he could do to a person. But he begins to use the circumstances and the, the abilities that Jacob thinks he has, and he introduces him to a man that's more clever than him. His man was, this man's name was Laban. Laban tricked him right off the bat with disguising his daughter as being someone that she wasn't in the same way that Jacob disguised himself before his father to pretend that he was someone that he wasn't. And all of a sudden, Laban begins to work into his life twofold, we could say, the deception that Jacob had worked into his father. And God, before a man is going to use him, will be hurt and broken deeply because God is willing to risk the pleasures and the ease of the temporal nature of life in order to establish a more permanent, eternal 
satisfaction that would come about through yielding to his will. Put simply, God is not concerned primarily with the personal creature comforts that we think he should be concerned with. He's more concerned with our soul. And therefore, he allows certain difficulties to come into our lives in order, not because he's mean. If he's mean, he could turn you inside out, make you slide down a cheese grater into a pool of alcohol. He could do that. He could do all sorts of things if he was mean. He's very powerful. But it's not because he's mean. It's because he's wise. The sovereign God who's in control loves you. And don't come to the conclusion, oh God, if you're sovereign, why do you allow these things to happen to me? You don't love me. Or, you know, on the other extreme, oh, you're loving God, but you just don't have enough power. No, he's sovereign and he's loving, but you forget one factor, he's also wise. And this wise God who is completely sovereign, powerful, who is completely loving towards you, doesn't do something or does something because of his wisdom, the thing that men forget. And so he's willing to allow the comforts of Jacob's life to go bad in order to bring about the greater purpose. And if you're God's elect, that is, you're his tool. He's called you to be a chosen vehicle or a a resource within his hand to accomplish his purposes. Watch him grind you. Watch him put your nose to the stone. Watch him do things in your life that are difficult. You know, there's a book that was written in Christianity a few years ago that said, your best life now. There's nothing that could be further away from the truth of Christianity, biblical Christianity. You know what the scripture teaches? Not your best life now. The scripture teaches your best life then. And there's a world of difference. One day, if it's our best life now, Hebrews 11 doesn't make sense. But because it's our best life then, Hebrews 11 says, so enter in by faith. So we look at the present difficulties that God is allowing to come into our life by faith. We say, God, I'm looking at these things. They're painful. They're difficult. But Jacob, probably not unlike you and I, spent many years having to figure this out. You know, by the way, there's one of a couple of different ways that you can learn. You can learn by going through the problem yourself and spending 20 years going through trial after trial after trial after trial. Jacob had to learn it for himself. That's one way to learn. Or the second way to learn is to listen to other people that have gone through the trial and you don't have to go through 20 years of pain. It doesn't mean life will be unpainful, but there's two ways that you can learn. You can learn it for yourself. It'll take time. It'll be difficulty. Or you can allow other people to shorten the learning curve so you can come to that grace that is in Christ at a faster pace. So Jacob had to learn it the hard way. We would be wise not to have to learn it the hard way and go through 20 years. We can just look at his life and say, I don't want to learn it this way. So Jacob was the man that was clever. He was always working the angles to come about and to bring about his own life in the, in the way that he thought it should go about. And God was finally allowing him to get tricked, allowing him to go through difficulty. We saw these in a whole series of studies in our previous weeks. But then here in chapter 32, he finally leaves the land of Padamaram. And while he's leaving, the first thing that happens is he's confronted with Esau, his brother who he duped 20 years before. His brother who swore that he was going to kill him, not just talk bad and slap him and call him silly Billy. He was going to kill him. And now he comes with 400 men, 400 men on horse. And these 400 men on horse were not coming so they could give him a really good big hug. Only one reason. Esau had not changed his mind. Esau was going to come and kill him still the same. But Jacob has an encounter with God the night before. And would you believe it that the encounter that Jacob had with God was actually the encounter that changed the heart of Esau? So that, as we see in chapter 33, when Esau did come, his heart was completely changed toward Jacob. I would suggest to you that if Jacob did not succeed in the way that God wanted him to succeed in this wrestling match between him and God, Jacob deciding, am I going to run my own life or am I going to submit to what you told me to do? This was the battle, and because he prevailed in the battle, we find that in chapter 33 that Esau's heart was changed. He comes and hugs him. He greets him. He loves him. He's kind and gracious towards him. And how many of us know that when God prevails over us, he prevails over the situations that are confronting us? This becomes a principle of life. I've seen it in myself. I see it in the scripture. 
The biggest issue is not me conquering situations. The biggest issue is allowing God to conquer me. And as he conquers me, he will conquer the situation. But as long as we try to stay autonomous in the situation, you know what that means. It means trying to stay in control of the situation and not yielding to the will of God. We will find ourselves suffering until we come to one conclusion. My name should not be Jacob anymore. My name should be Israel, which means to be governed by God. And before Jacob could come to this conclusion, he was confronted for one final time. Chapter 32, verse 22, as we just read, tells us that he arose that same night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children. He crossed the fort of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. Now, that may not mean anything to you, but it means something to me, and it will mean something to you in a minute. What was he planning He was strategically planning to separate his family into seven waves of blessings to Esau. He hears Esau is coming to kill him, his brother who he duped 20 years before. His anger is not assuaged. It's still coming against him. So he says, listen, I'm going to divide my family up into seven groups of people, chapter 32 already told us, and you go after wave after wave. And then when Esau says, why this blessing? He says, oh, it came from your servant Jacob, and he has much more. God has blessed him richly. And then another wave comes and give him more blessings, more cattle, more cattle more oxen, more sheep and goats. Give them more and say, oh, why this way? Because my servant has blessed me. And so he's scheming. He's trying to, in his own strength, figure out how he can establish himself upon the earth. You know, it's almost like what Jesus said, if you seek your life, you're going to lose it. But if you'll simply lose your life, you'll find it. If Jacob would have walked in trust towards God, like Esther in the book of Esther, Lord, if I perish, I perish. Has that ever been your attitude? Because the whole enigma of the Christian man is that he walks in a sense to his own death, knowing that if he dies, yet shall he live. The Christian life is not one seeking one's life, it's losing one's life. And the enigma is as we lose our life, we find our life. And this is resurrection life. We seek our life, we lose it. We lose it for his sake and the gospel. We find it, Jesus said. And therefore, we could say in a sanctified sense, the way up is the way down. The way down is the way up. Whereas Peter said, if you humble yourself before the Lord, he will lift you up. So the whole progress or discipline of the Christian man is that he doesn't go about the way the world goes about seeking one's life. He actually, in faith, not according to what he sees, but in explicit trust towards the God who he knows is real, acts towards that God. And as he acts towards that God, being different than the world around him, he sees God is alive. So that the only explanation for the man is that there is a living God. There's no other explanation. And as long as you or I can explain what took place or why it took place, it could be that God is not alive. It's rather me keeping him in business. But on the other hand, if he is alive and I've only yielded myself to what he's told me to do, he keeps me in business. And therefore, when men look at me, they say, what's the explanation for that? There's no explanation in human strength or energy. The only explanation is there's a living God and I've seen him. Where? In that man. In that woman. So Jacob still isn't there. Jacob is still scheming and trying to work the angles and figure out who he can rub elbows with and try to plan things out. Okay, get these guys out here and those guys out there and send these waves of people and I'm going to keep my family. And there's nothing wrong with loving your family. It's good. I love my family. I have five kids. But he did something wrong. Jacob puts his family, in a sense, above the Lord. And the scripture tells us, Matthew chapter 6, that you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'll take care of all those things, is essentially what he says. You put me first, and I'll establish those other secondary things. So what he does is he puts his family in front of her. He puts that relationship in front of her, in front of God. He puts that job, whatever it is, in front of God. He puts these things out in front of him. That's the picture that I see here. And he says, here, you go in front of me. You take precedence, we could say. He lays them out. He's trying to preserve them. But as opposed to preserving them, what is he doing? He's risking them. As opposed to establishing them, he's making them vulnerable. So that here he, with good intentions, is planning on establishing these relationships with his family. His heart is, I want to have a relationship with these people. I don't want them to die. That's his heart. But the problem is because it's put out of order and he's seeking them first, seeking their preservation first, 
he actually endangers the very people that he loves. He puts them in a place where they're now vulnerable to the attacks of Esau. And God allows Esau to come in judgment so that the only way that man can be established is that God is alive. And so here comes Jacob. He's clever. He's conniving. He's still Jacob. You remember the name. It means heel catcher. He's the one that's always manipulating the situation and trying to trip people up and grab things and make his life happen. God was blessing Jacob, we found in our studies. He was giving to him, and he couldn't enjoy the blessing because he took the blessings and I, I made them into idols. And such it is with us, you and me. We take the good things that God has, in fact, given us, and we can't enjoy them. We start clinging to the things that God has given us, and God says, now the good thing that I've given you has become an idol because you're seeking that good thing, that person, that job, whatever it is. You're seeking them above me. I gave them to you. Now you've made it an idol. Now I'll take them from you. And he shoots a warning shot over man's bow. He says, listen, pay attention. And when God speaks, he's not to be ignored. And you know, we, we play fast and loose in our culture as though God is a non-entity. We relegate God to our own opinions of him. You know, when God speaks, you know, sometimes people say, well, this is the picture that's going on here. Jacob is a picture of the man in the flesh until he becomes a man of the spirit governed by God. How do we distinguish between the flesh and the spirit? How do we know God is saying something or it's just our flesh fighting to keep something? Do we ever think these things through? I think them through. This is kind of my point of life, I think. How can you know whether or not the thing that's going on in your mind is a thing of the Spirit of God or the thing that's going on in your mind is a thing of your own flesh? And you know what the problem is? My flesh is always trying to preserve me. My flesh will never, ever tell me to do something sacrificially for the glory of God. You know what Alistair Begg once said? I've quoted this before. Give him credit for it. It's a great definition. On a study in James, he said, faith is costly obedience to the will of God. You know what that means? That God will tell Abraham to do something that costs him something, but if he doesn't obey him, he'll just become Terah. Set on the shelf and not become what God intended for the blessings Jonah said, those that cling to worthless idols forsake the grace that could have been theirs. You know what that means? That something is suggested to you by God, but you cling to what an idolatrous thing, that is something from God or something that's not God, you cling to it instead of God. God would have given you so much favor if you would have trusted him, but because you wouldn't trust him, you actually forsake the abundance of grace that he was going to pour into your life. And so God comes to men, and challenges them and says, trust me, walk with me, enter into the relationship with me. But men don't. Men cling to worthless idols. So when God speaks to you, think it through. There's nothing within the natural flesh that would desire to do the holy, sanctified thing. A guy years ago comes up to me and he says, he goes, I really don't know if this is the Lord telling me to give this large sum of money. And by the way, we don't preach money here, do we? We don't try to get money from people. And I only use this. I've only been here six years. I think this was probably in Spokane. He comes to me and he says, I don't know whether or not God wants me to give this large chunk of money. What do you, want, what do you think I should do? I said, well, time out. First of all, I'm not going to tell you what to do with that money. I'm not falling into that trap. I don't come to Sandpoint, by the way, to fall into that trap either. I'm not going to tell you. But what I wish I would have told him was this. Your flesh does not put those thoughts in your head. Your flesh puts thoughts like this in your head. Preserve self. Seek self. Seek your own life. Don't lose your own life. Oh, that will cost me too much. That's too scary to go there. That's too scary to do that. No, no, no. That's your flesh. And yet people say, God hasn't told me. And you know what that is? That's idolatry. Because God has told that man, for instance, because he told him, do something that is costly obedience to my will. Your flesh would never put that thought in your head. It's only the spirit of God. And it's only the one that is intent on obeying God that will listen to it and take any suggestion and run with it. You remember Jonathan, the, the friend of David, 
One day he was out battling the Philistines, and he said this. He said, Lord, if those Philistines say, come up here and we'll fight you, then I'll know you've delivered them into my hands. But if they say, come down here, wait for us to come down there, I'll know that you haven't delivered them into my hands. Now think about that. What puts Jonathan in the most vulnerable position? The most vulnerable position is for him to go up the hill to where the Philistines have the advantage. Jonathan, being a man of faith, said, God, here's my fleece. Not send 10,000 men around me with tanks and Air Force reinforcements, and then I'll know that you're with me. He says, God, you have them have the audacity to call me into the most vulnerable position, and if they call me into the most vulnerable position, I'll believe that it's you. He commits himself by faith to what he believes God is telling them and sets himself in the most vulnerable places so that God can receive his glory. So what happens? The men looked at him and said, come on up here. And he goes, yes, God is with me. And he runs into the battle. He didn't stop and go, oh, dang it. I was hoping they were going to say, come down there. Because here's a man of faith. He is waiting because he has long listened to the voice of God. He loved David the servant of God, as soon as the servant of God and the friend of the servant of God get together, they train each other to hear the voice of God. And the servant, Jonathan, hears God's voice in the subtlest of suggestions. And he says, let me act upon it. That's faith. But what people do is they think they walk by faith because they listen to their flesh. They said, my flesh doesn't want to sacrifice itself. My flesh doesn't want to do this. My flesh wants to gratify itself, to seek its own life. And Jesus would say, if you seek it, you're going to lose it. But if you'll seek me and my kingdom, you'll find the life that you're trying to preserve. And so Jacob comes to this point where he's putting things before God. He's putting his family before God, even though the family is good. Putting that, those relationships before God, even though relationships are good, they become wrong. And so therefore, God had to do something with Jacob. And you know what he does? It says it there in verse 24. It says, Jacob was left alone. And God will do something to separate you from those things. He will, if you will, shoot something over your bow to get your attention to say, you need to be alone with me. Stop listening to me based upon that job or that person or that situation. You think you're seeking me, but you're only seeking them. You're only seeking that. But get yourself alone with me. And you know what the man of God listens to? One voice. You know what he's concerned with? The audience of one. You know what the man of God believes? That I'm on the stage and I'm performing not before men. If there's a million men or two... It doesn't matter. I'm not performing before men. You know what the man of God believes? I'm performing before my great and glorious king. And everything that I do is based upon the audience of one. God, what have you done? What do you want me to do? And how should I behave? And so God gets Jacob alone. And in that sentence, we have the first key to the incident we're now considering And on these words, it's been well said by one man. He said, to be left alone with God is the only way, true way, of arriving at a just knowledge of ourselves and our ways. He goes on to say, we can never get a true estimate of our nature and all its actings until we have weighed them in the balance of the sanctuary. And there we may ascertain their real worth. No matter what we may think about ourselves, nor yet what man may think about us, The great question is, what does God think about us? And the answer to this question can only be learned when we are left alone, away from the world, away from ourselves, away from all our own thoughts, reasonings, imaginings, and emotions of mere nature, and alone with God. Thus, and thus alone, can we get a correct judgment about ourselves. Has God been faithful to get you alone? To remove anything away from you? Oh, Paul said, oh, behold, the kindness and the severity of God. Have you said, Lord, I want to follow you with my life? Do you realize that he takes that very seriously? And he says, thank you very much. We say, God, I give you my life. Thank you very much. I'll take it. He has the audacity to take it. And then he says, 
really, you're not going to listen to me? Then I'm going to get you alone. And I'll be very severe in how I get you alone. Here he is worrying that he's going to lose. Literally, what's his mind? My wife, my kids, they're going to die. They're going to die. They are at death's door. And God would have been that severe. Because if he didn't accomplish through Jacob what he was going to accomplish, men would have not entered into the promise, the, the covenant that he had promised. How severe is God in acting out his will? He would have taken those people out of Jacob's life if it meant Jacob coming to surrender to the Lord's will. And Jacob was left alone. And when God finally got Jacob alone, then it says, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. We don't need to go to it. In Hosea chapter 12, it tells us that it was an angel. Here in this passage, it tells us that it was the face of God. And so what do we find? An angel doesn't mean a created being. It means the messenger of God. Simply put, I'm not going to get into it. I can't get into it tonight. Simply put, it's the whole issue that God manifests himself to him with his message, confronting Jacob with what he wants Jacob to be and to do. A man wrestled. He calls him a man here. But evidently, it's more than a man. As you read the text, he wrestles with him. Now, many people... You've heard it probably before. I've used this passage to talk about how we are supposed to get alone with God and we're to wrestle ourselves before the Lord and we're to have victory in prayer and we have to have confidence and wrestle before the Lord, the throne. And uh, it's a great illustration that they use for the saints' power in prayer. But nothing could be further from the mark. There's nothing further from this in the biblical illustration. Jacob was not wrestling with the man to obtain a blessing. Instead, the man was wrestling with Jacob to gain some object in the life of Jacob. You see the difference? It was God wrestling with Jacob. It wasn't Jacob wrestling with God to get what he, God had somehow promised to him. And so here's this man that put this family above, even though the family is good. God has ordained family. And the biggest problem we have in our culture is family is being destroyed. But seek first the kingdom. And as he put relationships or jobs or whatever it is before God, it becomes an idolatrous thing that God has to separate the man from it to get him alone. And as he gets the man alone, he begins to wrestle with the man until he's broken, until the breaking of the day. We could say that light begins to shine forth. Here's the picture. It's dark. You're confused. You don't know what to do. And God says, I'm intent to wrestle with you until the breaking of the day, until the revelation of light, until my nature is revealed to you. And he said, I won't let you go in verse 26. And here's the third key that's given to us in the passage. It unlocks something precious in the narrative. Here we see the object of the heavenly wrestler accomplished. No longer could Jacob wrestle. All he could do was to cling. So this mysterious stranger brought Jacob to a point where he had to lean his entire weight upon him. He had, to, he had no longer had strength. He's clinging to him again. It says, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he went to a greater extreme, we could say. He touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And up to this point, Jacob had sought to order his own life. He was planning, scheming, devising. But now he was left alone. He's shown what a perfectly helpless creature he was in himself. His hip is knocked out of joint. His strength of being able to run away or to do his own thing is removed from him. No longer can he run. His hip is knocked out of joint. The seat of his strength is touched. He learned to say this, I will not let you go. And a man learns to begin to say, God, I will not let you go. Others in situations may come but I have no other refuge but you. My soul is ultimately clinging helplessly to you. And that was the point where God brought Jacob. And so it was a new era in the history of this supplanting 
planning, scheming Jacob. Jacob, who had been given a blessing by God, but couldn't see it because he thought it was him. He didn't really believe God. He didn't believe that God had given him these things, and therefore he made them idols, and so God now takes them from him. And now he finally comes to the point where he has nothing. And believe you me, God will be that severe. He will be that severe with man until man will learn to submit and say, God, your will be done. Break me. Take me. Use me. And I have nothing to cling to but you. I have no other refuge. And the supplanting, planning Jacob, he held up to this point to his own means. And now he's saying, I won't let you go. But mark it also carefully in the passage. It wasn't until the hollow of his thigh was touched that Jacob had said this. And in the same regard, it's not until we helplessly come to this point of nothingness that we're brought to cling to God and really to seek his will to be done in our life. God bless me. And not only did Jacob say, I won't let you go, but he says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And what is he saying? Not the prayer of Jabez. He's saying, God, I want your will to be done in me. And if we approach it in that way, there's blessing. So how severe is God? He isolates the man. He wrestles with the man. And notice also that God doesn't immediately, he could at any time make Jacob do exactly what he wanted. But he wrestles with him. He struggles with him. And in the same regard, we see in his grace, he wrestles with us. He struggles with us. He could come to you and to me in a moment and just boop, pop our hip right out of joint. He could do that. But this was his grace. And let me say this, if you don't understand it, ask God for wisdom in it. When God warns us, that is his grace. When he wrestles with us, that is his grace. Because he's trying to avert a greater judgment into our life. He's saying, trust me. And the man says, no, I only trust what I see. I only trust this moment that I am. I'm only trusting myself to hold on to what God had given me. And he says, let it go. And if we don't hold loosely, as Corey Tim Boom once said, I've learned to hold loosely to the things God has given me because I never know when he'll require them of me. If we cling on to the wrong things and not onto God, he has called us to cling on to him and to let loose of everything else. And Jesus has the audacity to say, if you approach me in this way, you'll never be found wanting. But if you cling on to something, that I have even given you, it'll become an idol and I'll have the audacity to remove it from you. So he wrestles with Jacob until Jacob can come to the point of saying, all I want is you. All I want is you, God. And he clings to him and he wants God's will for him. But again, as I said before, behold the kindness and the severity of God, as Paul says in Romans he says in verse 27, and he said to him, what is your name? And at first glance, you may think, well, you know, God's ignorant. You know, here's this man wrestling with him. And he goes, oh, by the way, what's your name? I mean, could you imagine wrestling all night long and not knowing the guy's name that you're wrestling with? I think he knew his name. But I think it was rather an opportunity for Jacob to make a confession. What was Jacob's name? Heel catcher, supplanter, the guy who trips other people up. What was God doing? He was giving Jacob the opportunity to confess his sin. Jacob, what is really your nature? Your, your, what is your nature? Secondly, he's bringing to remembrance what he did to Esau. All these years go by, 20 years, and you think, well, that was 20 years ago. And what does God do? He says, we're going to address this because it never got addressed. But it was 20 years ago. Yep, and you never addressed it. What did he say 20 years before when his father said, what is your name? He said, my name's Esau. Now what happens 20 years later? God asks him the same question. What is your name? And you know what he said? I'm a supplanter. I'm Jacob. I'm a heel catcher. I'm a schemer. My name is Jacob. 
And God brings a man to this confession. And when he brings him to the confession of the reality of who he is, are you still trying to pretend to be Esau? Are you still trying to pretend to be someone you're not? What is your name then? In verse 28, he said to him, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. (laughs) So for a very long time, Jacob had been ordering the events of his life. God had promised him, God had given to him, God had blessed him, but now Jacob decides that taking the blessings of God and I'm going to order them in the way that I see fit. And he orders his life and the sum effect is that he contended life with God and with men as the text says. And you have prevailed or you've succeeded, Jacob. You know what this means? Jacob had strength. He had striven. Would you say it's true that Jacob had striven with a lot of different men? Would you say it's true that Jacob had worked his way and won with a lot of men? Would you say it's true that Jacob, we could say, had youthful strength, that he could do what he want, when he want, where he want, and it worked? Would it, you say it's true that Jesus in John chapter 21 looked at Peter and said, Peter, when you were young, you went where you want and did what you want, but when you're old, you'll go where you don't want to go, and this he spoke of the kind of death he was going to suffer. How does a man become mature and complete in Christ? We move from the one who does what I want, when I want, how I want, where I want. In other words, me claiming to be God to the one that has yielded these issues to God. Jacob had contended for the birthright and he had succeeded in Genesis 25. He'd contended for the blessing and he succeeded two chapters later. He contended with Laban in chapter 31, and he succeeded. He contended with men, and he succeeded. Now he contended with God, the wrestler, and he fells. And when he fells in his contest with God, he changes his name to Israel. Now, the nature of the word there, and I'm not going to get into the Hebrew, is the emphasis is upon God taking the action, Israel. And it means God contends. God is the one doing the action. Your name is Jacob. You are contending. You are the one doing action. Now your name will be Israel. God is the one who's doing the action. And so they've struggled over what exactly does this word mean. It means that God has prevailed. God has finally had victory. God has finally found his authority within your life. And when Jacob finally, having been wrestled with by God, comes to the point of brokenness, he knocks his hip out of joint, takes his strength away, wakes him up, shoots the warning shot over his bow. Finally, he comes to a point where he says, what's your name? Are you still Jacob? And Jacob essentially said, no, I'm not. I'm not trying to make my life work. I'm not trying to take the blessings that you've given me and applying them the way I want them to be applied. I am under your orders. I'm under your governance. I'm walking by faith. And what you tell me to do, I'm going to do. And therefore, my name is no longer going to be Jacob, he tells him. He says, your name is actually going to be Israel. God is now going to take an action in your life. You will be governed by God. His name was changed to Israel. And God now commands him. Before he was commanding God, before he was listening to his own flesh and saying, well, God told me this and God told me that, but it was your own flesh. He hadn't come to the end of himself. And men don't know how to distinguish between the flesh and the spirit. They think, well, you know, if I don't want to do something, it's not God. It's not true. A man has to struggle against his own flesh until he becomes complete and mature in Christ. God now commands him. God now is teaching him, and God has taught him that you don't have strength, Jacob, but I'll be your strength. You know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? He says, God has given me a thorn in my flesh because of the great revelations, surpassing revelations that he's given to me. But I've learned something, that in my weakness, strength is perfected. 
And so I've learned to glory in weakness because weakness is the tool that God will use. You see, as long as a man is still strong, he may think he's helping God out, bringing about God's plan. He is deceiving himself. And there's much that's done in the name of Christ that is absolute deception. But when a man finally comes to the end of himself, I could say the zero point, then God begins to move in a man's life. Then, and only then, Christianity is not about a cultural experience based upon the congregate of people gathering into a self-affirmation society and calling it church. Then you experience the real God in real ways, not just a flannel graph Christianity that gives the appearance of like we all kind of rally around the same concepts, but we don't really believe he's alive. He's just a fuzzy piece of uh, two-dimensional piece of fuzz you put upon the wall. Then when you come to that point of dependency, then you see that we serve a living Christ. But until a man has wrestled with God and allowed God to prevail, Christ will be a concept that he'll try to put God into business and he'll never sense God's blessing, even though God's blessing is there. He'll never experience the walk that God has intended and God will have to continually be brutal until he has conquering power within the man's life. Jacob had arranged everything for meeting and for appeasing his brother Esau. He had schemed the whole plan out. Now God is going to take him in hand and order all things for him. And to learn this lesson and take this low place before God, Jacob must be humbled. He must be lamed as to his own strength. He must be made to a man that now limps instead of runs and walks. Jacob's new name was to be henceforth the constant reminder to him of what he just learned here. Your name will be Israel. It'll be a constant reminder. You are to be governed by God. And he was never to forget the lesson. His name was Israel. And the fact that it was not he who was to order and to arrange his affairs, but God was stamped upon him through that name. God is commanding me. God tells me to do something, I do it. God is the one. He's the one who made suggestions. It was my idea to run away. It was my idea to trick my father. It was my idea to listen to my mother. It was my idea to to try to to get Rachel before God's time. You see, Rachel was going to be given to him, but he tried to grab her before the time. It was a time. And he took her before the time. And he was always clever. He brought pain into his family because of his cleverness. But now he says, God will command me. And Jacob had prevailed. But now God had prevailed. Jacob could make his life happen. But now God would command him in the direction that his life ought to go. And he says in verse 29, and then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. And he said, why is it that you ask my name? Please tell me. The name is the nature of the person. Oh, God, you have prevailed against me. Tell me your nature. And God would say to us, why do you want to know my nature? Hear this. If you can understand it, great. If not, pray. God does not reveal himself to us for our own curiosity. He reveals us to himself so that we can know him and relate ourselves properly to him. So there's all sorts of people that have been conquered by God, but then their first attempt to say, what is your nature? What is your name? And God would say, but why do you want to know this? Why do you want to know my name? Is it so out of my curiosity it can be satisfied? Or is it so that I can relate to you based upon who you are? Do you understand the difference? There's a world of difference. What is your name? And God might say in some sense, I don't share that with everybody and anybody. I share it to those who fear me and tremble before my word. Here's the one to whom I reveal myself. He is contrite and brokenhearted and trembles before my word. I don't share my glory. And so here's this man. You want to have fellowship with me in the Holy of Holies? The veil must be rent. 
the flesh must be rent. Hebrews tells us the veil is the flesh. So we can come in and say, God, what's your name? He says, there's only one way you can come into the Holy of Holies. That great veil must be torn. In other words, my curiosities about your nature must be put aside. There must be an intent to know me for who I am, not for whom I want to construct. And men want to know about God. It has more to do with the desire to be in control of the relationship. But when we rent that veil, then we want to know God for his name's sake alone so that we can be conformed to his and his nature alone. I hope you understand that. If not, ask the Lord. What's your name? Why do you want to know? And there he blessed him. And so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, which means the face of God, for I've seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Isn't it interesting later on in chapter 33 when it says that he sees Esau in verse 10, chapter 33, Jacob says to Esau, no, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand, for I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. Do you understand the connection there? Who did Jacob deceive? Jacob. Who wrestles with Jacob? God. But he appears like what? A man. What does this man who conquers Jacob by supernaturally knocking his hip out of joint and leaving him permanently crippled? What does this man do? He says, you look like the face of God. What is the first thing he says when he sees Esau? You look like God. He hadn't seen his brother for 20 years. You know what I think? Just a speculation. If you disagree, it's perfectly okay. It's just a speculation on this point. You know what I think happened? I think he sent a man to wrestle with him that looked like his brother Esau. I think when he became flesh and appeared to him, he looked like Esau. He didn't know it was Esau. But as he's wrestling with this one who is God, but he looks like Esau, the first thing he does when he sees Esau, he's like, you look like God. God was confronting him, if that's the case, if that's what happened. He was confronting him with his past with his own attempts to cleverly make life happen. And God is kind, but he is brutal, but he is kind. And he brings these things, not because he's mean, but because he knows the path to life. We can skip the trial that God has taken us to and think that we can move on, but God will bring us back to the same trial. I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. And then here's the promise of faith. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. And therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of his thigh. Let me me sum this all up and wrap it all up and tell you what I learned. As I've already suggested to you, this picture of Jacob is the picture of our flesh. Us in our flesh trying to do what God has told us to do, but always doing it in a way that is preserving flesh, not yielding it to God. And when he finally is conquered, he's the man of the spirit. He's governed by God. Before, the man of the flesh, he's ordering his life and saying, God told me this and God told me that, but it's him doing it. Then he's broken. He's no longer Jacob, but he's Israel. Now when God just subtly suggests something, I know that my flesh would not tell me to do that. It's not my flesh saying, give that large sum of money to to the work of the Lord. That's not my flesh. My flesh never says that. Never. Your flesh will never say it either. But the Spirit of God suggests something, and we say, okay, Lord, if that's you, if you want me to do it, I yield myself, and he listens to it. So now he's the man living by the spirit, not the man living according to the flesh. So in this passage and in the subtleties that are there and the clear statements as well, I see in Jacob here the character and the activity of our flesh. That first of all, our flesh is always devising and scheming. Our flesh is always trying to work things out and ignoring what God has said. But I see secondly, I see the worthlessness and the helplessness of the flesh. Here's Jacob scheming, send seven rows, seven things, and you sanctify it because it's seven, and we know the number seven's God. Seven. That's why sermons are always seven points. Even if they don't have seven points, they make them seven. 
They state the same point twice or something like this to make it look like they have seven, so it's a perfect sermon. That's why I deliberately I do odd numbers, like, oh, I got six and a half points or four points. Or something. It's seven. We're going to send seven rows, seven la- We're going to send them to God. Oh, it's spiritual? And he's still scheming and devising in his flesh. But what did all of those waves do? Read the next chapter. Esau goes, why in the world did you send these? These did nothing for me. What made Esau change his mind? Not because he sent seven rows. It's because Jacob was finally conquered by God and he yielded. And in that night, something happened supernaturally. And Esau now, when he's riding on his horse angry, something gripped his heart. Something happened in the heavens. And Esau approached him and said, I don't want to kill him anymore. I don't want to destroy him. So what are we going to do? We're going to wrestle with God and make it happen. Or we're going to let God wrestle with us and bring us unto his will. Prayer is not about us getting our will. It's about God conquering us. God, what do you want? I want the very thing that you think that I'm not doing, but in fact, I'm doing it. I'm the one that gave you that suggestion. I'm the one who told you to do this. I'm the one that's leading your life. I'm the one that gave you these things. I'm the one. Trust me. I'll direct you. But he's too clever still until he's broken. And all of his scheme was worthless. And so I see that our flesh is always devising and scheming, pretending it's God when it's not. I see, secondly, that we see the worthlessness and the helplessness of our flesh. It does nothing. And thirdly, I see that our nothingness can be discovered only as we get alone with God. So has God gotten you alone with him? Has he taken something from you, separated you from those droves of your own ideas, your own family, your own situations, as good as those things can be? If they're before the Lord, it's an idol. Has he done something to get you alone with him? Praise him. Praise him. God, thank you. I trust you. You must really like me. You know, when God has been severe with me, I, I turn it for the good. I say, God, you love me more than, than anyone else I know. You, want, you know, I don't know why I say that? Because in Hebrews, he tells us something about those he loves. You know what he does? He chastiseth them. You know what that means? We get spankings. (laughs) God, you must love me. Some people he has on a chain. I'm on a choke chain. I can't get away with anything. I want to get away with things. My flesh is like yours. He doesn't let me get away with anything. I look back and I say, God, thank you. Thank you for revealing that to my wife. Thank you for my wife or my parents or brother and sister in Christ, for confronting me in that. Thank you, Lord. But you know what the proverb says a fool is? A fool is the one that hears the voice of God and says, oh, that's just man. He rejects the voice of God, and he tries to build a case in his mind that it's not God. He who has an ear, let him hear. But the wise man, the proverb says, considers all things, takes it before the Lord and says, God, was that you? My flesh wants to preserve flesh, live for self, make life happen. My, and it's at war, according to Galatians 5, with my flesh. The Spirit is at war with my flesh. And therefore, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, not acknowledge the Spirit, are led, that is, you act according to the Spirit of God, are the sons of God. This is how we work out our salvation, not working for it. We work out what God has given to us. And this kind of understanding of God can only happen when you get alone with God. And God has been brutal in my life. I trust he'll do the same with you in order to get us to a point where we know him, not know about him. Do you want to know God? It's the greatest privilege on earth. And I find, fourthly, not only our flesh is always despising and scheming, I see, secondly, the worthlessness and the helplessness of the schemes of our flesh. I see, thirdly, that the nothingness, our nothingness can only be discovered when we get alone with God. But I see, number four, that God will subdue your flesh and wrestle with you. He wrestles all night with you. He's patient with you. He'll do it all night long. We think this is God's curse. It's God's blessing. He'll wrestle with you. He'll wrestle with your flesh. Again, I referenced Galatians 5. And then he, number five, touches the hollow of Jacob's thigh. 
This is the method that God pursues. How does God get his attention? He touches the hollow of his thigh. It's the bringing us to a vivid realization of our own helplessness. I mean, I think about men. The Song of Solomon talks about the legs of Solomon. They're like the cedars of Lebanon. Have you ever seen cedars of Lebanon? They're massive trees. What does that mean? He had really nice looking legs, (laughs) right? And men's strength is in their legs. Some of you have skinny legs. Your skinny legs are still your strength. (laughs) And he takes away your strength. He touches the hollow of your thigh, the very place that is your ability, your strength, your freedom, your ability to do what you want, where you want. Here's God bringing a man to the end of himself. Seek your life, you'll lose it. Lose your life, you'll find it. God has the audacity to promise that if we'll abandon ourselves to him, he will actually meet us in power and in strength. And he touches the hollow of his thigh to make him aware that he is helpless. Help me, Obi-Wan. You're my only hope. Help me, Obi-Wan. And such is the case for the Christian. (laughs) Help me, Lord. You're my only hope. And the sum effect of this kindness and severity of God is that it causes the man to cling to God, no longer clinging to his life, clinging to what God has given him, clinging to his own ideas, and I'm going to do what I want and call it God. But now he clings to God. By the way, how do you know if God's telling you to do something or not? Will the thing that he's, you're debating over cause you to be more set apart to him or less? You know what we do? We make decisions about this thing that I'm choosing will cause me to be more set apart to that job, more set apart to that person. That's not the test. Will it cause you to be more set apart to him? And now a man clings to God, no longer clinging to the things of this earth. Finally, we discover that it's not until he has written the sentence of death on our members that we shall cast ourselves unreservedly upon our Lord. And then number seven, I see that not until we discover our nothingness will we be willing for God to command our lives. Not until we discover our nothingness, God, you tell me what to do. God, Israel, you command me. You take the action. Before I was taking the action, Jacob, now you take the action. Israel, governed by God, God command me. God, you tell me. Give me even the littlest suggestion. Jonathan says, the littlest suggestion. If I even, God, have them call me up there. Okay, that's good enough for me. I'm going to do it because this the smallest suggestion came to me. That's all I need because I'm looking for opportunities to obey God's will. I'm not looking for opportunities to do my own. And so not until we discover our nothingness will we be willing for God to command our lives. And number eight, in the words, and he blessed him there, we learned that when God commands, blessings follow. You may think the command of God is going to destroy. He says, no, blessings will follow if you obey my commands in number nine. And then the loving sequel that's given here in verse 31, and he passed over Penuel and the sun rose upon him. I think nothing defines the blessing better than that. A dark night of wrestling. Then he sees the face of God, Penuel. The sum effect is the blessings come, the sun rises upon him. Have you ever gotten up early in the morning? The beauty of the Judean desert, stunning. It's golden, golden. The limestone looks golden, literally gold. If you go to the Dead Sea, it looks like gold, like honey. You think there's like a honey all over the ground. You're thinking, wow, it's salty, but it looks sweet. <laughs> and then last, note how accurate is the picture. The sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore, the children of Israel eat not the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. I see two things, and I close. 
Number one, when you allow God to prevail in your life, it doesn't affect just you. It affects your children. The things that I'm doing for the Lord right now, I watch, I'm watching my children, not because I'm Christianizing them, I'm watching my older kids choosing to follow the Lord. I bump into their room and find them accidentally reading the Bible. Not because I tell them they don't have to read the Bible at all. My kids do not have to read it. I'm finding them make choices to follow him. And because I've allowed God to have victory in me, it's passing to my children. But you know who I'm working on now? I'm not working on my children. I got five kids. I'm not working on them. The two youngest one I'm still working on. To live before them. To allow God to conquer me more. And it'll bless my kids. But you know who I'm working on now? Their children. And I'm looking at the children of my children and saying, God, let me be the man in their life so that they will pass on that remembrance that as I was conquered by God, so they would allow themselves to be conquered by God. Not just looking back and appreciating the blessing that came to them because I was conquered by God, but then going further so that now they would allow themselves to be conquered. They would remember that conquering, and in this case, not touching the hip socket when they ate it. But secondly, I see that only the sinew shrank. It wasn't removed. And in that sense, the flesh shrinks. It isn't removed. We have to be constantly ruled over by God. There's still flesh within us. It must be put under the authority of the king. The only way my flesh will not rule over me is not for the flesh to disappear. It won't disappear. I need the flesh to be ruled over by a power greater than me. So, Lord, let the flesh shrink. Let my children not eat of it. And let us learn from the life of Jacob, the life that is sanctified and set apart, conquered by God, and let us become men and women for whom it can truly be said, we, in fact, are governed by God. Our name has been changed from Jacob to Israel. So, Lord, I pray that you would give wisdom to those who have ears to hear. And I pray that you would speak. And, God, these are forceful words, but they're true in their life. I pray, God, that you would take your glory. And you would help us to honor you. I thank you for these precious people. I pray that you bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.